Welcome everyone. And um, I'm Amy Litt, president of the California Botanical Society. And I'm pleased to welcome you to this month's seminar featuring early career botanists. Um, a couple of announcements before we get started. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and somebody will have to tell me if you can actually see this because I have two monitors and sometimes it doesn't show what. Can, can you see this uh, announcement? Okay, yeah. great, thank you. Um, okay, so um, please um, everybody sign up, Where? register, <laughs> mute yourselves, please. Um, can, you, can everybody please mute themselves if they've unmuted themselves? Um, uh, at any rate, um, please um, note uh, we are having our um, every other year graduate student symposium and our every year banquet this year at Cal Poly Humboldt, um, the first weekend in April. Um, this is a, a symposium that is entirely organized by graduate students at Humboldt. And all of the speakers, with the exception of the keynote speaker, are graduate students as well. Um, it's a great opportunity to interact with other botanists, to meet people from across the state, meet friends, make new acquaintances, and also um, to hear what our um, brilliant graduate students are working on. Um, so um, so uh, we have extended the abstract deadline. It says here March 10th, we've extended the abstract deadline for a month. Please encourage your students to submit abstracts um, and please register yourself and your students. And let's hope that we see everybody in Humboldt um, a, a little bit less than a month from now. So the, you know, the, the video stuff is up there. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, uh, okay, also, uh, we will have some openings on the, um, the Botanical Society um, Council coming up this year and in future years. If you're interested in getting more involved in the society, having a role in, in decisions and what happens, steering it into the future, um, you can contact me or anyone on the council. Um, my email address, if you see my name, it's amy.lit at ucr.edu, and I'll put it in the chat when I'm done talking as well. Um, finally, um, uh, whoops, hold on a second. Okay, um, so um, today's speaker is indeed an early career botanist. Riley Scaff is a senior at Pitzer College in Claremont, majoring in applied ecology, studying with Marty Meyer. Um, and their senior thesis is on the topic they will be presenting on tonight. As a high school student, uh, I mean, excuse me, as a college student, they have already won the California Botanical Society Paul Silva Award, a WM Keck Summer Science Fellowship, and a grant from the San Gabriel chapter of the California National, uh, Native Plant Society. They've already been involved in a, in a wide diversity of research projects, including um, white-faced capuchin monkey behavior, the effects of herbivory, herbivory on post-fire coastal sage scrub recovery, the use of rare earth metals in deep sea corals to study ocean carbonate levels in the past 20,000 years, and a multi-pronged study of endangered Castilea mollus. And this is all in addition to his, their senior thesis work. <clears throat> Um, after graduation, they've accepted a seasonal position with a botanical survey crew in Valle Caldera National Preserve, and Riley does plan to go to graduate school after a gap year or so, so um, keep that in mind because I think anyone would be lucky to have them as a graduate student. In addition to having created their own major and doing this impressive work on restoration of Joshua tree habitat, Riley bakes sourdough and is an accomplished violinist playing with orchestras, chamber ensembles, bands, and apparently just about anyone else who wants to play. They are also a landscape photographer. And the picture that so many people admired of the scorched Joshua trees is one of the many you can see on their website. And I will put that in the, um, I'll put that uh, website in the chat also. In the meantime, I'll just show you one other one so you can appreciate, uh-oh, can you see that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. So beautiful, beautiful photographs. Yeah. 
Okay, with no further ado, Riley. Hi, um, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. That was, that was crazy. Um, I'm really excited to talk with all of you today, actually, because I feel like the Mojave Desert has been something that's always been really close to my heart. And I feel like it's a really unique part of the California floristic province that so much of us, or so many of us have chosen to become a part of and, you know, make part of our lives. Um, but I feel like it's kind of an area that we overlook as we're driving towards the Sierras or to Vegas or something like that. So I'm really excited to talk more about it, and especially this kind of unique part of the Mojave Desert, which um, unfortunately has suffered from a pretty catastrophic wildfire recently. Um, so I was going to talk a little bit more about my background, but I feel like that has largely been covered um, by the wonderful introduction by Amy. Um, but yeah, as she mentioned, I'm a, I'm a senior at Pitzer, um, and I'm originally from Los Angeles. I grew up here. And just to talk a little bit about this applied ecology major, it's not a major that Pitzer College offers um, here in Claremont. Um, it's really a hybrid between biology and geology. And the reason I picked it is that I, I kind of have these dual interests. I love ecology and plants, and I feel like that's kind of my home base. But at the same time, I have an interest in um, the geosciences as well. In biology, I'm, I'm really interested in plant ecology. I also love restoration, which is really what this project is focusing on. Um, and I'm interested in conservation more broadly in general. Um, and I hug trees as much as I possibly can. Um, but then on the geologic side, I'm also kind of interested in these broader earth systems. And I feel like geology offers that kind of deep time perspective that um, we don't get often in the biological world where, you know, a thousand years is a lot. And, you know, in the geologic perspective, that's a blip. So um, I'm really interested in the intersection between earth systems and living systems. And I feel like soil science is really where that happens, especially when we talk about plants as kind of the growth medium. We think about that with, you know, mycorrhizal fungi and um, bacteria and things like that as well. Um, and it's really where the parent material and the crust really meets kind of living systems. Um, and that's really intimately tied with geochemistry and nutrient cycles, which are really kind of these like broader ecosystem patterns that um, we notice in our kind of, you know, ecosystems as a whole that we might not see on a more granular level. Um, and I love looking at cool rocks too. Um, I love sandstones and granites and all of that stuff. Um, so I want to introduce the place before introducing the study, which I feel like is not always how it's done, but I, that's kind of how I got to know this part of the desert. And I feel like it's kind of worthwhile to like introduce it as a place before introducing the research, just to give people a better idea of like kind of what it's like there. Um, this is from July, 2020, which will become notable later. Um, this is an area near, um, it's in the Mojave National Preserve. So it's kind of Eastern California and you're kind of looking towards the 15 freeway as you're on your way to Vegas, kind of off here in the foothills. Um, and it's at, at about 4,800 feet. And you can see it's pretty lush. It's not really what you think of when you think about desert. It's, you know, it's got shrubs, it's got dense Joshua trees that really look more like a forest than a shrubland. Um, and, you know, you've got coyotes running around, you've got mountain lions up in the hills, you've got mountain goats um, and, you know, rabbits and hawks in the sky and, you know, lizards crawling over the boulders and stuff like that. It's, it's a really vibrant ecosystem that, especially in the springtime, really comes alive. Um, so now I want to back up a few tens of millions of years and talk about just sort of a brief geologic history since I just talked up my geology background. Um, so this is a map of the Mojave National Preserve. This is the 15 up here, just to kind of orient you. And you can see kind of this map up here kind of contextualizing, you know, we've got Los Angeles, Vegas is kind of over here. And there's a couple of shades on the map that I want to point out in particular, this kind of beige. Um, this is this is SEMA dome. And it's it's odd because it looks like a perfect dome when you look at it on a topographical map. It almost looks like what you think of when you think about a shield volcano, but it's actually not, it's just a natural erosional feature. And this whole area, you know, these little beige specks are basically from what's called the Teutonia Peak Batholith, which is between 100 and like 170 million years old. Um, 
And the rock in this area is composed, unlike the Sierras, which are kind of a, a lot, a lot of times kind of a classic granite, these areas are less quartz rich and they're more rich in um, the feldspars. And so you've got, um, they're, cat they're categorized as a quartz monzonite, which basically means you've got not a ton of quartz or yeah, not a ton of quartz, but you've got some potassium feldspar and plagioclase feldspar, which also has sodium and calcium. And I bring this up because really all of this orange is being is essentially quaternary alluvium. So this is alluvium that has piled up in the past few million years. And it's all being derived from this batholith and other similar batholiths from, you know, 70 to a bit younger. There's some Jurassic rocks as well. Um, but really the soil in the area is, is sort of um, governed by this rock that um, was there before. And just to give you an idea also about the um, soils, uh, I dug a soil pit at my field site later on, and you can see it's, you know, it's pretty undeveloped. It's very sandy. It's probably categorized as like an, an entosol or an inceptosol if you were to put a soil science definition on it. Um, it's pretty sandy. There's not a lot of development, but you can see some roots here, and there's not a lot of horizonation in the top meter of soil. So um, that's just worth thinking about, I think, um, that, you know, this is kind of like an area that hasn't really been weathered very heavily. Um, so this is the picture I showed before July 2020. Um, it was lucky that I took this photo because a few months later, actually maybe one month later in August, um, it burned in what is now being called the Dome Fire, which was one of the massive wildfires that um, swept through California in that really horrible fire season we had in 2020. It burned about 40,000 acres of Joshua Tree Forest and it's important to illustrate that wildfire in the Mojave Desert does not behave like wildfire in, you know, uh, an ecosystem that is evolved for wildfire like a conifer forest in the Sierras. So this was really the impact if you kind of overlay the images. Um, this was, I think, the picture that Amy was pointing out. Um, this is January 2021. And you can really see the landscape level change that there's really nothing left here. Uh, the mortality of Joshua trees was estimated at about 1.1 million individuals, which comprised about a quarter of the contiguous Joshua tree forest in this area. And it's worth pointing out that the Joshua tree forest in this area is actually more dense than the Joshua tree forest in Joshua Tree National Park. So this is really a valuable climate refuge, especially as kind of a higher elevation area that's not gonna get as hot as the climate's warming. Um, so just to talk briefly about the kind of fire ecology in the Mojave Desert, as I mentioned, this phenomenon is kind of historically infrequent. The Mojave Desert is pretty naive to this kind of form of disturbance, unlike other more forested or habitats um, that experience it more, more regularly. Um, it's also worth noting that uh, there was kind of an uptick in wildfires in kind of the 80s and 90s, really due to things like, you know, people blowing out their tires on the highway or throwing cigarette butts out the window. And in the 90s, people started to get smart about this and put in some regulations that helps them decrease. So you can see kind of on the left here, human-caused wildfires seem to get less frequent over time, starting in the 90s and going into the 2000s. Um, so thankfully, those are kind of on a downward trend. But at the same time, this bottom row shows the annual burned area in hectares. And it's important to note the log scale here, too. Um, so even a slight upward trend in this over time is actually a big deal. Um, and the reason I bring this up is that um, for some reason, despite human-caused wildfires decreasing in frequency, the annual burned area seems to actually be stable or increasing. And the natural wildfires, despite not really increasing that much in frequency, you know, maybe a little bit, the annual burned area is also trending upwards. And that's kind of a big deal because that means that whatever wildfires do happen are spreading further and getting worse. And that means that there's more habitat that's getting destroyed. And, you know, there's a limited amount of, of habitat in the Mojave Desert. So at some point it's gonna become, you know, a bigger and bigger problem. And it's also worth noting that um, the geographic uh, sort of preferences of wildfires or the geographic behavior of wildfires is not universal. So um, Brooks and Matchett put this together in 2006, and they pointed out that um, 
mid elevation scrublands and high elevation woodlands uh, seem to be affected very differently from more low elevation shrublands, which are kind of your classical like Hollywood Mojave Desert feel, you know, kind of sparse vegetation, not a lot going on. And also your desert montane environments, which are really like, you know, up at like seven or 8,000 feet. They're dominated by juniper woodland and they're not as affected by um, things like invasive grasses, as I'm going to talk about later. But this kind of middle elevation scrubland, like, you know, 4,000 feet, 5,000 feet. This is like kind of the Goldilocks zone of wildfires. And that's kind of where this wildfire occurred. Um, and really the, the two horsemen of the apocalypse here are um, the uh, two species of grasses that are actually native to the Mediterranean and have somehow taken a foothold in our beloved desert and also all over California. Um, and these are Bromus tectorum and uh, a bunch of species of schismus that are very difficult to tell apart unless you're a grass person. Um, and what these grasses do people. basically is, um, growing, they grow, they do two things. One is they grow underneath, uh, these kind of older perennial shrubs, like, uh, creosote bushes, which actually kind of form little nutrient islands underneath their canopies. And what this does is if a fire comes through, those shrubs burn hotter than they otherwise would, making the fire more severe. And the other thing that they do is they grow underneath, um, uh, in the kind of interstitial spaces between shrubs, which normally might be unoccupied or occupied by plants that aren't that flammable. But I mean, you can see on the left here, this is essentially just kindling. Um, and if you were camping, you might use it as fire starter. And unfortunately, wildfires will use it as well. And it kind yeah, of well, connects interstitial spaces and allows them to spread further. So it kind of explains this trend and, you know, why the wildfire frequency might not be increasing that much, but the burned area every year is increasing a lot more. Um, so I was sitting there in 2020 thinking, you know, I love this part of the desert. I want to do something about it. What do I do? And I knew nothing about restoration. So I started just kind of cold emailing people. And the first group or person that I emailed um, was over at the USGS uh, Southwest Biological Science Center. And her name is Molly McCormick. She's awesome. Um, and she, at the time, I think she's moved on now, but um, she was the coordinator for the Restoration Assessment and Monitoring Protocol for the Southwest, otherwise known as RAMPS, because everyone loves a good government acronym. And um, they were putting together this sort of networked restoration experiment in the Southwest uh, called RestoreNet that essentially is based on one set of draft protocols which she was more than willing to send me very generously. And the idea is that, you know, if all the experiments follow a similar methodology, then they can be carried out by land managers all over the place and kind of networked into one nice clean data set. Um, so she forwarded me those draft protocols and let me kind of design an experiment loosely based on that structure, but a little bit downscaled for um, senior thesis purposes. And then the next person I reached out to was um, the vegetation program manager at the Mojave National Preserve, Drew Kaiser. And we had a really good conversation. And what we were talking about really was trying to come up with a list of species that grow locally in the area because local adaptation and local species distributions are very different in the Mojave Desert. And something that grows at 3,000 feet might not grow at 4,000 or 5,000 feet. So he knew the plants really well, and he, we were able to come up with a list of species that might be important candidates for restoration um, in terms of a re, kind of reestablishing a native plant community in the area. Um, and then he was also willing to lend me some seeds from the Mojave De uh, National Preserve Seed Bank, which was extremely helpful because collecting thousands and thousands of seeds is a ton of work, and um, implementing them in restoration is also not easy. So. Um, having those access to those seeds let me build a seed mix, which I was later able to use. Um, and then finally, you know, the sort of final obstacle was where is this restoration experiment going to happen? And one problem if, you know, you've ever done restoration on, on federal land is that it's actually quite difficult to get the permits in place. And the USGS had actually tried to do a restoration project in the burn area and wound up kind of deciding it was better, you know, those resources were better spent elsewhere because it's a lot of work. And thankfully, there's an organization called the Mojave Desert Land Trust, which buys private inholdings within uh, sort of conserved areas run by state or federal agencies and conveys them back to those agencies so that they can better steward the areas. Um, 
And I contacted and Drew suggested that I reach out to them. And it turned out that they actually had some uh, parcels in the burn area and they were willing to let me use one of them. And they were willing to sort of hold on to it for the time being so that I could do my restoration experiment before they conveyed it to the park service. Um, and so that was really possible thanks to a few folks at the Mojave Desert Land Trust, uh, including Amy Langston, who is, was sort of the land uh, program manager there. And then I also got in touch with Medina Asbel at the Mojave Desert Land Trust, who runs their restoration nursery. And um, we were getting in touch because I was also interested in doing an outplanting study where plants are grown in a greenhouse for anywhere between five months to two years. Uh, and, to, and then they're sort of, you know, raised in this nice spoiled environment and then they get sent out into the world, um, hopefully better able to survive on their own. So through this sort of lovely collaboration, um, I was able to sort of cobble together a study that essentially has a few phases. Oh, and um, to briefly mention also, I, I got in touch with my um, current thesis advisor, M Marty Meyer, who's a fire ecologist and focuses largely on the California sage scrub here in the LA area. But he was also, um, uh, did a lot of work to help sort of help me design the experiment and how it would work. Um, so huge thanks to him. Um, so through this process, I was able to design essentially kind of a three-pronged study. The first component, which um, the California Botanical Society funded through this Paul Silva um, student research grant was a seeding study. So essentially taking a bag of seeds and you know, sprinkling them on the ground um, in a scientific way, and then uh, implementing some treatments to kind of increase germination by doing things to the ground essentially. And it also gave me a chance to sort of survey the natural um, recovery of the area and kind of look at what's growing there naturally. Um, and the second prong, which was implemented in fall of 2022, last fall, uh, was outplanting a bunch of seedlings to try to see whether certain treatments could sort of increase survivorship of those individuals. And it also gave me a chance to evaluate which species might perform better in this particular area. In this unique soil type, burned soil is not like uh, normal unburned soil. So um, it's an opportunity to see which plants will kind of do well in this kind of unique disturbed environment. And then finally, I started getting interested in the soil and wondering maybe could some of these factors be sort of governed by the growth medium uh, that all these plants are growing in. And so um, I don't really have the data for this yet, but I'm uh, but that's sort of in progress is sort of a soil study looking at some of the geochemistry and soil ecology of this area, looking at um, different species of bacteria and fungi growing in the soil in different areas and also looking at um, things like carbon nitrogen uh, ratios, stable isotopes, and also um, kind of major and trace elements in the soils to try to see if there's any correlation between that and how the plants are doing um, uh, in the restoration study. So this is just an overview of the seed mix that I used for the seeding study. Um, you can see we've got uh, buckwheat over here. Uh, the seed mix is dominated by buckwheat and um, this is a uh, linear leafed golden bush, um, which is also a really cute shrub. It puts out these really pretty um, yellow flowers. It's in the Asteraceae, so it puts out obviously kind of a nice sunflower. Um, and honestly, you know, I would have hoped to sort of put a more even distribution of seeds, but the availability of seeds kind of dictated how much could go into the whole, um, into the whole mix. So this was kind of the bulk percentages. So you can see it's really dominated by buckwheat and this other species. And then there's a few others, um, purple sage. Um, this is a species of penstemon that grows locally in the area. And then um, a couple of other sort of shrubs and wildflowers, all native perennial species. Um, and that was sort of these, these were the sort of percentages that were um, seeded on my plots. So now I wanna talk briefly about kind of the different treatments that I was using to try to increase germination of seedlings. Um, so the first is kind of uh, this mulching treatment. So um, after seeding, I would sort of put mulch on my plots. Um, and the idea is that it would help sort of protect seedlings from things like wind or you know even granivores like rabbits and stuff like that. The second treatment is sort of digging little pit depressions in the ground. And the idea is that it sort of traps rain, uh, rain water when it rains and sort of helps channel it into the seeds directly. Um, 
and it it's possible that it also helps protect them from wind by just sort of creating a little de little depression in the in the soil um and that one you know has been shown to actually have some promise in some areas and then the third one is this kind of neat nurse plant structure um uh they're called connectivity modifiers or con mods and they sort of simulate a nurse plant by uh you know they're constructed of kind of this half centimeter hardware cloth they're made in kind of a plus sign and they're sunk a few centimeters into the ground and the idea is that they sort of um trap silt and kind of promote a healthy growth medium as an, as another plant would by just sort of drawing up um you know soil to the roots and kind of drawing up nutrients um these are all treatments that were sort of designed by the USGS in this RestoreNet protocol. And the overall structure of the experiment was also based on uh, this USGS experiment. So um, the structure to sort of go backwards a step um, was essentially based on, you know, a bunch of two by two meter plots. Um, and I fenced them all in. I, I think they were, I think it was about 22 of them or 24 of them all fenced in uh, with chicken wire to deter, you know, little, especially like rabbits and, um, you know, little kangaroo rats and stuff like that in the area from eating the seeds and the seedlings. Um, I don't think it worked very well. Um, I saw some burrows in the plots later, so I don't really think the fencing worked at all, but that was the goal. Um, and so I had these 22 uh, two by two meter plots and I, I divided them into blocks and each block contained four two by two meter plots. So one of each of the experimental treatments and then one treatment where I didn't do any ground disturbance or anything like that, but I just put the seeds down. And um, there were five replicates of each of these blocks. And then I reserved two extra control plots where I didn't seed anything just to get an idea of what would grow there naturally if I didn't do anything. Um, and that made up the 22. And then finally, I, I made some reference plots by essentially seeding each species individually in a little in a little area. And the idea was that in the springtime when things were germinating and coming up, uh, it would sort of aid in identification, being able to compare the little seedlings directly to um, to what was growing in my plots, um, because identifying small seedlings is a lot more difficult than um, adults. Um, None of that ended up being necessary because this was the plot in um, May of 2022. And you can see there's actually a fair bit of growth, all things considered. Um, but the problem was there weren't any seedlings um, of anything that I seeded, uh, which was kind of confusing. But um, I used the opportunity to survey the plots anyway and just to, just to see what was growing there naturally. And because there was nothing in my seed mix growing, I could sort of rule out any possibility that um, what my seed mix had provided was sort of supplementing what was growing there naturally. So I used it as sort of a natural growth experiment. Um, and this was kind of, this is one representation of the species that were growing there um, in the spring. And one thing that's really noticeable is that um, the bromes, this invasive cheatgrass, was making up a plurality of the um, individuals that I was seeing in my plots, which was definitely pretty notable because that's something that has been brought up by other restoration experiments in the past and other monitoring, post-fire monitoring studies in the desert is that this kind of, you know, increase in bromes after any kind of disturbance is pretty common. Um, and there's other invasives that have popped up as well. So this is, you know, some brassica, this is um, brassica nigra, uh, black mustard, and this is uh, Erodium cicutarium, which are both also invasive. So invasive species are definitely making a big difference. And the other thing that's noticeable is that there are definitely some strong differences between my treatments, even in the natural growth. And so clearly whatever ground disturbance I was doing was making an impact on what was growing there naturally, despite those plants already being in the seed bank. Um, this is kind of another way to spin it by um, separating by treatment. And you can see that, you know, these experimental treatments, the mulching, the connectivity modifiers were really, um, had some really prolific growth on them uh, relative to the other plots. And, but anything where I was like walking on it and, you know, digging pits or putting mulch on it, all of those seem to promote natural plant growth over this sort of non-seeded control where I really didn't touch it at all. Um, and that was really interesting to me 
and the other noticeable trend that kind of stood out to me is that whatever seems to help the native plants grow also seems to help the invasive plants, uh, which is sort of an interesting trade-off when you think about restoration. You know, if you're promoting native plant growth, that's good, but if you're also promoting invasive plant establishment, that could be bad. But, you know, where do you draw the line? And it's often very difficult to promote native plant um, establishment without some, without sort of facilitating extra growth of non-natives and invasives as well. Um, so that was kind of an interesting development, but then the plot sort of thickens in the fall when I went back last fall and surveyed for natural, um, uh, natural plant growth again. And this time, none of the species that I had found in the spring were even there. All of the, whatever had, popped up all these annuals, little forbs and herbs and stuff like that. They'd all gone away and you wouldn't have even known they were there. And now a, an entirely new class of um, plants had taken, had set up shop and you can see it really looks like a grassland. And that's because it is. Um, these, now the distribution is really covered by um, several species of native plants. One of which is um, this kind of portulaca, which is a really neat plant actually. It's kind of, got, it's kind of this red, viney weird plant and I would love to learn more about it and the other two dominant ones were um, two species of gramma grasses in the Budalua genus they're both c4 grasses but the interesting thing is that despite being kind of co-dominant um, they actually have very different biologies uh, Budalua gracilis is a perennial and it's pretty long-lived and it's also widely distributed across uh, western North America it grows all the way up into Canada um, but Budalua aristidoides is an annual and only grows in basically the Southwest. Um, it's still a pretty wide distribution, but it's really in the Southwestern drylands. So I thought it was interesting that these two species of the same genus had set up shop here, despite being kind of different biologies. But I did think it was notable that both of them are C4 grasses because another species that's actually quite common across the burn area just from walking around is, um, I think it's here, Hilaria Hilar regida. Um, and this one is also uh, a C4 grass and is also a long-lived perennial bunch grass. Um, so I thought it was interesting that maybe the photosynthetic pathway is sort of favoring these plants to become established in this disturbance environment. Um, and you can see here the, the concentration of invasive plants compared to native plants is way down from the spring, which was nice to see, but the confusing element is you know, what, is, what are going to be the sort of seasonal dynamics of this vegetation community where normally this plant community is used to uh, long-lived perennials kind of anchoring the ecosystem and then this kind of annual cycle popping up, you know, every spring and sometimes in the fall, if you get kind of summer rainfall, which we got a lot of last, uh, last summer, um, and what happens when those perennials go away and the cycle is entirely dictated by annuals and, you know, sort of seasonal dynamics where, you know, what's there one season will be gone a few months later. And that's really noticeable. I went there um, literally last weekend and most of the grasses were actually gone and the plot was kind of covered in snow. So I couldn't do the field work that I was going for. But um, the kind of crazy thing is that a lot of the grasses are gone. Um, so. I'm really curious what to see what's going to pop up there in the spring. Um, but I just wanted to point this out as kind of a reference point, despite not having data for um, this particular time. Um, so kind of the main takeaways of this research have been that, A, the seeding did not work, at least not yet. Um, and this kind of echoes what a lot of people in, the, in doing desert restoration research have found, which is basically that, you know, it's not very possible to do restoration by seeding because the uh, climate is just too extreme. And desert plants are very much a sort of quantity over quality seed reproduction plant where they put out thousands and thousands of seed that have very low germination rates, um, sometimes less than 1%. And when you take that and then you take the sort of extreme climate, it really doesn't result in very good um, success when you're trying to reestablish plants by seed. Um, so it seems that, you know, I don't have data for this yet, but it seems that outplanting might be the only way to really bring back native plants to this area. Um, the second notable element of this is that the ground altering treatments did actually um, increase plant establishment, uh, despite 
being natural plants in the seed bank, especially the nurse plant structures worked really well for that, um, which could be useful in other contexts, despite, you know, the seeds not really taking the fact that these treatments did work is evidence that, you know, the environment, the plants will respond to um, these different ground altering treatments. Um, and I, I sort of saved everyone the misery of looking at a table with a bunch of decimal numbers in it, but um, I did an ANOVA and a bunch of, and backed it up with some Tukey HSD tests to kind of determine the, the, the statistically significant differences between the treatments. And it pretty much matched up with the bar graphs as far as um, the patterns we see. Um, you know, what helps native plants also helps non-native plants. Um, and it really, seems to indicate the need for more monitoring, considering that, you know, if, if you just went there in the summer or the spring, you would notice one set of plants. And if you came back a few months later, the community would be completely different. Um, so I'm planning to continue monitoring this area for a little while. Um, and the sort of concerning element, I think, to uh, land managers is this kind of trend towards kind of a type conversion from this shrub land with a lot of long-lived perennial shrubs to something that's really heavily um, uh, grass heavy, whether it's invasive grasses or native grasses, it's still a pretty strong type conversion. And what we know from past data on post-fire recovery in the Mojave is that perennial shrubs really don't recover that fast, and usually they don't really recover at all. And so this is kind of where the restoration element might come in, is sort of helping to give these plants a head start um, in coming back, because a lot of that will is really essential if you want to bring back any kind of functioning ecosystem as far as you know animal communities are concerned or birds or insects or anything like that they're going to rely on that um, a lot of those sort of staple um, perennial uh, shrubs especially creosotes burr sage um, buckwheat things like that so that's sort of the bulk of what i've done so far and now I'm kind of waiting on some data and also waiting for it to warm up a little bit. But I wanted to highlight a few things that, I'm, that are kind of in progress right now, um, one of which is this outplanting study that I mentioned earlier. So last fall, um, myself and a few, and a few folks um, who, were, who were generously willing to come out to the desert and dig holes in the ground for many hours with me, uh, came out and planted about 450 um, seedlings in these kind of rings around burned shrubs that I'll talk about in a second. Um, and we're really waiting on um, it to warm up enough in the spring to kind of survey their survivorship. But that's kind of one thing that's in progress right now is seeing which species survived well. Um, uh, and also recording growth. I, I measured all the plants at the start of the experiment. So it'll be kind of neat to see how much they grow, if at all. Um, and looking at kind of differences between species and also between treatments. And this is kind of the, the structure of the um, experiment. So in last spring, I noticed that there's a lot of these yucca, uh, banana yucca shrubs uh, growing out on, the, out on the field site in addition to Joshua trees. And there are all these skeletons kind of scattered across the, the desert floor. And I noticed that um, there were some kind of weeds that seemed to be growing preferentially underneath these shrub canopies compared to the sort of interstitial spaces where there wasn't anything growing. And I started to kind of wonder if they were actually kind of providing some kind of favorable growth medium, even though they weren't alive anymore. Um, and so I designed an outplanting experiment based on it where um, kind of half the plants are, are planted in a little ring um, kind of underneath these shrub canopies approximately. And then the other half of the plants are planted outside um, in these interstitial spaces with the idea that, you know, it sort of forms this match pairs experiment where if you have, you know, buckwheat growing in here, and a buckwheat growing outside, um, we'll be able to analyze differences in survivorship and also um, growth uh, change in height over time. And then the other half of this was um, was a caging treatment where uh, half the individuals were caged to sort of deter herbivory um, because a lot of these kind of rabbits and um, things like that, they'll actually dig, they don't really eat the foliage very much it seems like, but they will dig little burrows at the base of the roots, which really isn't good for the plants. Um, and so the cages are ideally hoping, helping to like deter that a little bit. Um, so this was kind of the basic structure of the um, outplanting experiment. Um, and hopefully when it comes springtime, I'll do a sort of post-winter survivorship assessment. And then 
really the big kind of um, next milestones will be the sort of post-summer survivorship to see how many of them made it through the hot summer. And also the sort of, um, you know, one year or two year marks for survivorship. Um, and that will help uh, land managers hopefully identify some ideal species for outplanting in the future. Because um, if you're thinking about resource allocation, it's important to, to realize that, you know, you want a high chance of success. And so knowing that something like a buckwheat or, you know, this perennial bunch grass that I uh, mentioned earlier, something like that, if, you know, if it's surviving in really high proportions, that might be worth investing in uh, growing it in the nursery for months to outplant and sort of help um, kickstart this ecosystem a little bit in terms of perennial plant growth. So the final little prong of this, just at the tail end of this, um, is a little soil analysis. So I wanted to see if, if there was sort of a, any kind of evidence in the soil of differences between the yucca shrubs and the sort of interstitial spaces to kind of parallel the outplanting study um, so I collected a bunch of paired soil samples between the yucca shrubs and about one meter away um, for a total of, you know, 20, uh, uh, 20 samples. And um, I sent some of them off just a couple weeks ago for uh, carbon nitrogen analysis at UC Davis. And the goal of this was twofold. One of them is stable isotopes. So stable nitrogen isotopes are a proxy for essentially like nitrogen forms. Um, so uh, a delta N15 value is sort of the, the data point. And the more, the more kind of nitrogen metabolism happens in the soil, whether it's microbes or something else, um, the soil will essentially kind of accumulate with nitrogen 15 because the lighter nitrogen isotope N14 is sort of preferentially taken up. Um, so the theory is that it's sort of a proxy for how much available nitrogen there is for plants to use. Um, but then at the same time, it also will give me natural abundance of uh, carbon and nitrogen and also the ratio of the two, which is very important for plant growth. Um, so that's kind of one wing of it. The next wing is X-ray flu uh, fluorescence. I'm taking advantage of having the geology department here at um, Pomona College uh, to get sort of major and trace elements. Um, and that will kind of inform whether there's differences in you know, kind of important nutrients that we don't normally think about, like potassium or calcium or um, sodium or, or other metals like molybdenum or iron or something like that. Um, so it'll give the whole suite of major and trace elements that it can do. And then finally, um, I've sent some samples off for uh, getting bacterial and fungal biomass, um, just to see if there's a difference between the sort of how, how well these um, microbi soil microbiotic communities are growing. And then I also extracted DNA from soil samples and sent them off for sequencing with help from two biology professors at Pomona, um, E.J. Crane and um, Professor Andre Cavalcanti. Um, and the goal there is to see whether there's sort of specific species that are differing between um, the sort of shrub canopy areas and the interstitial spaces that might be important for um, important kind of symbionts for plant growth. So I'm especially thinking about arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, but um, soil bacteria we're learning are also very important in desert soils. Um, so I'm kind of interested to see that data will come in in like a month or a month and a half. So I'm really curious to see where those next stages will take me. But, um, for now, this is kind of the, where the experiment is right now. And it's got these kind of multiple prongs, but I'm hoping to kind of tether it together into one more kind of cohesive idea of what's going on in terms of restoration in the Mojave Desert. Um, so thank you all so much for listening. And I just want to put out a few more shout outs. Um, down here for some of the, all the professors who are not formally recognized. Um, uh, Professor Diane Thompson is my uh, second, uh, second thesis advisor. And um, the several professors have also helped um, advise me along the way, despite not being on my committee at all. Um, and then I also want to shout out a few students who have helped with field work and lab work. Um, and then also uh, thank the California Botanical Society, not only for having me speak today, but also for um, funding the, the seeding experiment that yielded this really interesting um, kind of natural uh, recovery uh, and sort of plant community research out in the Mojave Desert through the student research grant. And also the California Native Plant Society for funding the um, a lot of the geochemical analysis that I'm doing. And finally, um, Blue Planet United, who is also um, uh, a few folks from Blue Planet United are actually present here today. 
Um, and they've also helped fund a lot of the um, nursery, uh, nursery expenses. So um, thank you so much. And um, if anyone has any questions, this is the perfect time. Um, and just, I can't really see people, so just feel free to jump in. I, I, um, Riley, I can, I can moderate. Um, <laughs> uh, so just give me a second. So uh, before we get to Forrest, who has his hand up, there is a question in the chat. I think you should be able to post the questions to everybody. I changed that setting, um, but this one came directly to me. And it says, if you find something useful for restoration, how do you scale up? for tens of thousands of hectares? That's kind of a difficult question. Um, and it's kind of something I'm thinking about. Um, a lot of it comes down to land management agencies. So right now the Mojave National Preserve is actually undertaking a large effort um, to restore Joshua trees to this area because as we know, they're, you know, they're threatened by things like climate change and human development. This is a climate refuge for them. So they're undertaking an effort to plant tens of thousands of individuals over the coming decade. And they're using a, a nursery in Lake Mead um, called the Song Dog Nursery, which is, has actually been recently renovated to help kind of supply plants for that. And I actually got to use a few of those Joshua trees in my study. Um, and that effort I think is really monumental. However, I also kind of think that part of the goal of this study for me was to sort of point out the fact that to have native plants or to have a native plant community and to have a functional ecosystem, you can't just be planting a monoculture of, of plants that are charismatic and important. You also have to plant, you know, the sort of boring plants like buckwheats and things like that. And so there is, you know, in this, I mean, I don't know about other places locally, but in this area, in this instance, you know, there is infrastructure for large scale um, growing of plants for restoration and all that needs to happen is we need to know what to grow and where to grow it and in some cases how you know do we cage them that takes resources what do we like kind of you know what do we invest in basically so in, in a lot of cases there is like infrastructure for large-scale restoration projects but it, these small-scale studies the purpose of them is really to kind of point them in a direction um, yeah, does that answer your question? Sure. <laughs> um, Forrest, did you have a question? Your hand disappeared. Yeah, I lowered it when uh, you said that I was up next. Oh, okay. uh, I have heard some studies up in the sage, you know, in the Great Basin Desert about trying to restore the microbiome, sort of the soil microbiology and how that can kind of kick out some of the invasives like the brome. Have you considered, you know, trying to do inoculations from undisturbed areas to try to get back some of that native microbiome? You did mention that you've done some sampling of that. Yes. Um... I'm actually really interested in that. That's a really good, I, that's a really cool idea. I didn't know about the sort of deterring um, of invasive species through inoculation. I did actually inoculate um, the seeds for the seed mix with um, unburned soil from nearby. Um, so when I was like essentially mixing the seed mix with and bulking it with, um, with soil, I was actually borrowing from, an unbur from a nearby unburned patch. Um, so I did do some of that, but I, I think to some extent, it's like, you know, and maybe that's one reason why the some of those plot, some of the plots where I actually seeded were more were sort of growing better than um, than the kind of control plots where I didn't do anything. But um, I'm definitely really interested in in those in essentially supporting microbiomes in order to deter invasive species. You know, sadly, I don't have any, like, I don't remember the citations. It was something that I saw a few years ago, but mm -hmm. it, you know, I'm pretty sure you could find it on like, you know, go Google Scholar or, you know, anything on the Great Basin. Cause it, it was actually it showed a very marked decrease in the bromus when they got the native microbiome back. Mm. That's interesting. I think that would be really worth looking into. Cause I think the, the sort of removing of invasives through things like pesticides or, or manual remo removal, I think is sort of a, a never ending 
death spiral that, you know, sort of like, it's not sustainable in the long run. So something like soil inoculation for that would be much more, much more beneficial. Great, um, Peter. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for the talk, Riley. Um, is anything known about natural recruitment of the, the native species that you seeded out? Are seedlings ever seen? And if so, where or in what kind of years? Um, that I'm not sure of. Some of them, so the, the plants that I seeded, they do have different biologies. Um, if I go back to, if I can scroll back to my seed mix list. I mean, my impression is that, you know, things like the buckwheat are, are pretty good at, um, at reproducing. The rest of them, my impression is that they're, they're putting out of seeds is fairly sporadic. Um, and their seeds have fairly low germination rates as they are. And then, you know, when they do become established, it, it is kind of occasional. It's definitely not every year that they will like put out a bunch of seeds and become established. Um, but I don't know how much specific data there is on like, you know, how well those, those things naturally recruit on their own. Okay, thanks. Um, there's several questions in the chat, and so I'll read them oh, to yeah. you. Um, Arik says, awesome talk, Riley. Do you think any of the summer rains may have washed away your seeds? Any thoughts on reseeding? I doubt it, but honestly, I think the wind, the, this area gets really windy in the winter, and I think if anything, the wind would have been more likely to wash away seeds than the rain. The soil is so well draining that it doesn't really flood in this particular area. It just kind of goes down. Um, but the, the wind is definitely a possibility as far as like <laughs> seeds blowing away. Okay, in that case, maybe, you know, look look somewhere down downwind <laughs> <laughs> and see if you find all your seedlings. Um, Lawrence asks, did any creosote grow back after the fire? Not yet, and I kind of doubt that it will, honestly. Um, existing data on post-fire uh, kind of natural recovery in, in different desert areas suggests that creosotes and other kind of long-lived perennial shrubs like that generally come back in extremely fractional like abundances if they ever come back at all. Um, so yeah, I haven't seen any yet. Okay. Joe says, um, I don't have restoration experience in the desert, but here on the central coast, we have found that without supplemental irrigation for the first few years, very few container plants survive. Will you be looking at watering at all? I thought about it. Um, it's a bit of a big logistical effort to, to irrigate seedlings. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a one person operation here. So I would love to, I would love to irrigate, but at the same time, I'm also hoping that um, the plentiful winter rainfall that we got this winter will kind of help um, hold the plants over. I haven't thought about irrigation as far as um, like later on down the line, like in the summer or something like that, but um, the, the studies on irrigation as far as like effectiveness are a bit, are surprisingly mixed results. Some of them say that it does favor survivorship in the long run. Others say that irrigation has no impact at all. Um, and that it's really more about how old the seedlings are when they are transplanted and then the sort of initial irrigation. So I did irrigate each one with like a liter of water, which isn't actually a lot, but um, especially compared to other regions, but these are desert plants. So I'm hoping that it'll be okay. Um, these, these irrigation protocols are also based on the USGS restore net. And so I try to sort of follow those methodologies as much as I could so that if that if data from other restore net plots got published, I would sort of be able to compare if, in case they use some of the same species. So that was also a consideration. Great. OK. And Lorraine asks, where did you source your seeds from? And did you consider planting locally sourced genetically appropriate seed for the Eastern Mojave and for starting your seedlings? 
That's a great question. Yes, all of the seeds were collected within about three to four miles of the field site. Um, okay, go back. Um, I collected some of them. So for the outplanting study, the National Park Service had a few of the species, but not all of them. Um, so I did have to collect for a couple of species and I just sort of collected kind of around this area, um, kind of similar elevation band. Um, and then all of the seeds that the National Park Service collected, which were 100% of the seeds that I used in my seed mix, all of those were, were, were collected in the SEMA dome area. So this is kind of this whole region. Um, so yes, they should be, they should be matching with the sort of genetic, uh, the sort of local genetics of the plant populations in the area. And does anyone, oh, okay. Um, oh, well, okay. There's a comment here from Marilyn Scaff, who has the same last name as you, <laughs> uh, which says, fantastic work, Riley. I'm honored Blue Planet United could help the project. Um, it, it seems there may be some family members, <laughs> which is great. I'm happy to see that support. Um, Emily says, with regard to your outplanting experiment and the possible influence of yucca baccata skeletons on other plants, do you have any idea about what factors the presence of the yucca remains could make more favorable? I'm not sure, but looking at the soil, so one possibility is that simply the fact that they're sort of, you know, they're these kind of long, they're also kind of, you know, they live for a long time. They have pretty complicated root systems. Um, it's possible that just through the fact that they've been growing there for a long time, they're sort of helping um, increase the, you know, sort of silt composition of the soil. That's been observed in other species like creosotes where they kind of draw up nutrients um, and form what are called fertility islands or nutrient islands. Um, that phenomenon has been sort of proven for, um, creosotes, although it's kind of interesting because they form fertility islands, but they also have some allelopathic compounds. So they're kind of luring plants in and then kind of trying to kill them. But, um, it's also been observed in, um, Bursage, uh, Am Ambrosia dumosa, I think. Um, so part of the goal was trying to prove that maybe other species than these particular shrubs also exhibit similar properties. The other thing that I've noticed is that they have a lot of like charcoal in them because they're the, the like skeletons themselves are really like kind of thick woody branches. Um, I'm trying to see if I have, um, like you can kind of see it here kind of in the background, like the yucca, you know, they're kind of these thick stalks. And I think that they, when they burned, they might've burned for a longer time. Kind of like if you have a campfire and you like burn a log, it's like, going to burn a lot longer than a twig. So I kind of wonder if the charcoal concentration in there is sort of affecting something, but honestly, I'm not completely sure. Um, and part of the, the goal of doing the different geochemistry and soil ecology was to try to figure out, you know, if like to sort of use those geochemical data to sort of suggest hypotheses about what might be going on essentially. Any more questions for Riley? No? Okay, well, thank you again, Riley. Um, that was a fantastic talk, um, really interesting. And I am looking forward to hearing of your future work and the, um, your continued work on restoration and all of the many things you're interested in. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'll I'll stick on for a little